All right, I think the first thing I'm gonna do is take my jacket off so I can do my Steve Jobs impression. <laughs> uh, okay, I put, I put this little presentation together um, about a week ago, and um, after listening to a lot of the sessions that took place already today, I'm realizing that some of the stuff you've already been exposed to enough, so I'll kind of skip over some stuff relatively quickly. And there's other stuff where I feel like maybe I can add a little um, color to it in terms of just trying to focus you on the things that are most worth thinking about um, while you have your experience at, at TIFF. Um, one of the things you may be asking yourself is why me for this particular job? Um, and the first thing I'm gonna say is that I have a long history with the Toronto Film Festival. Um, in 1975, which is when I started working in the, the film business, um, I was working for a, a, a small independent film distribution company based in New York called Cinema Five. Uh, they were kind of a cool company. They did things, they released things like the Lena Vertmuller films and Monty Python and the Holy Grail and things like that. And it was a great education for me, but I was in their non-theatrical division, which meant that I was actually selling to college campuses and libraries and prisons and things like that. It was not, I was not like on the front lines of theatrical, but one day I was sitting um, in the office of my boss, Don Rugoff, who um, was this really crazy guy. Um, I could spend two hours just talking about him. Um, and a phone call came in uh, while I was sitting there from somebody who said uh, to him, listen, we're, we're gonna have this film festival in Toronto and we really wanna get American distributors there um, and we're willing to pay for somebody to come to the film festival, so why don't you send somebody? And Don hung up the phone and he looked up at me and he said, do you wanna go to Toronto for the weekend? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Um, and so I ended up at the very first Toronto Film Festival and I've actually been to almost every one since. Uh, to, to the best of my recollection, I may have missed three somewhere along the way. Um, and so I feel like I've really seen this place mature as a festival. The first year that I was here, it was a tiny little event, um, mostly up in Yorkville, using the theaters that were available at that time in that place, most of which have been torn down or are being used for other things now. And, um, and, and I have to say that one thing that makes me very happy is that in the last few years, the consolidation of the festival in this downtown area, I think, is makes it a much more navigable film festival than it used to be and much easier for all of you to accomplish what you're gonna want to accomplish while you're here. Um, so, and one of the things I, well, I'll get to this later. Okay, so, so that's sort of one answer about why me. The second answer is, um, and this is by the way more for me than for you, um, is that I've been both a buyer and a seller. Um, while I've spent the majority of my career as a distributor and marketer of films, um, in my in-between stages, I've actually been involved in trying to sell films, and so I've navigated the film festival from film festivals from both points of view. And to make matters even more complicated, I've been both a producer and a producer's rep. So um, I can talk a little bit as we go on about what those roles are and how they interface and whether you need a rep or not or you know all that kind of stuff. Okay, so. Um, Let's talk about, in a very, very general sense, what is a film festival for? I was thinking about this earlier when I was listening to a lot of the comments that were being made, and it feels like a lot of you, although certainly not the short filmmakers, but a lot of you have aspirations to get your film distributed. And that certainly is one of the biggest um, things that one can accomplish at any film festival, theoretically. Um, but the truth is that it isn't just any film festival, because in order, to have buying and selling go on, there's one important piece of information that would have to be true, which is do buyers and sellers actually attend? Now, interestingly enough, um, the Toronto Film Festival is one of those places where buyers and sellers do attend in great numbers. So that it's not just because you're Canadian that this film festival is special, as an American who's had films here over the years, I can tell you that this is one of the most important markets in the world. But you, you've heard over and over again today about how the, the market here in Toronto is unofficial. 
Um, and I want to just talk about what the difference is. Just, you know, on a very basic level, the difference between a festival and a market. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever attended a pure film market, something like the American film market or, um, you know, one of those kinds of events. Anybody? Yeah, okay. Um, film markets are not curated. They're not um, events that are actually putting the films out there up front from a quality perspective. Film markets are places where you can actually buy your way in. By the way, it's generally not, not inexpensive. In other words, getting a screening time at a market costs a significant amount of money. But the American film market, which is a really good example of what a film market is, a pure film market, basically it's in Santa Monica, California. It takes place at a hotel where all of the, the sellers have um, suites in the hotel where they're showing off their wares, whether they're films that have actually already been made or not. There's certainly posters on the wall for films that have not seen the light of day yet. Um, they're showing trailers, some of which are for films that are finished, some of which are for films that have yet to be made. Um, but they're basically holding court for buyers, theoretically, who would be interested in pre-buying or buying the movies that they have to sell. And they also take over all of the downtown theaters in Santa Monica during the day and have screenings going on constantly on all these screens. And the buyers are going from screen to screen to screen, not necessarily watching the whole movie. They just walk in, take a taste of the movie, walk back out, et cetera. So what it means is that the, the kinds of films that tend to sell in a pure film market are films that have real marketing hooks attached to them, usually star-driven or genre-driven, or are things that we, you know, I, I, this is gonna sound a little bit pejorative, but things that are not execution dependent, which is to say they don't have to be very good to be of some value to some distributor somewhere in the world. So that, you know, the cynical side of me says that a buyer walks into the room, they look up on the screen, they say, okay, it's in focus, it's in color, um, it's supposed to be starring such and such a person, and there they are on the screen, so they're clearly in it. And it's an action film, so let me give it five minutes and see if there's any action. And assuming that there is, then the buyer can probably put a pretty good value on what the video rights might be in Korea, just as an example. Those are the kinds of films that play well in markets. But the problem is most of the films that I've been involved with in my life, and I would assume because you're all in the Toronto Film Festival, the films that you made that are here are films that require a little bit more information than that to decide whether a film has a market or not. And what a film festival offers that a film market doesn't is what I would call context, meaning that it's about press and it's about public. The press and the public help you make your case that this movie that may not have anybody you've ever heard of in it or doesn't have a director who anybody has heard of yet or doesn't have an obvious genre that can't be pitched in one sentence, that these are all things that are overcome by audience response or by press response. So what it means is that the festival offers a context that you can't get at a market. Now mind you, there are um, film festivals like Cannes and Berlin that have a market that's going on simultaneously, but you have to understand that those are actually two separate events that are happening at the same time in the same town. The most interesting thing about Toronto is that there's no separate market. That the market is the films that are being shown in the festival with that context. So what it offers is a unique opportunity. If you're in this festival, they have the support that one would have in a pure film market, but every film that's being shown is curated in some way, where as a buyer, I can have confidence that somebody has watched this and thinks that it's of some value, number one. So that whole thing about um, uh, a film that is execution dependent is partially answered because the reality is it wouldn't be in this festival unless it had been executed in some fashion that the curators feel has some value. And then the second part of it is that we now have the opportunity as a seller to use the context of press and public to prove to buyers that we have something that's special that is not necessarily clear just based on what's on the surface. Um, now, we were talking about buying and selling distribution rights as a reason to be in a film festival, but the other reason, another reason, 
to be in a film festival is launching a film into release. Now that's the way the studios and some of the larger independent companies, including the larger Canadian distribution companies, use the Toronto Film Festival. Whole different agenda. These people are using the festival, in essence, as a way of getting an enormous number of press to see a movie and launch it right into the marketplace. In many cases, they're, um, they're planning on releasing the film very quickly after the film plays it at the festival, in which case the press that they generate is literally leading right into the release. In other cases, they may have in mind a release that's going to be a little bit further down the road, but they're hopefully storing press away that they can use at the time that the film actually does open, perhaps building up some buzz around it. Um, you know, that, that's a whole other agenda. Um, now, in the case of a film festival um, strategy, the question now you ask yourself if you're going to be launching a film out of a film festival is do the press actually attend in the same way we're talking about do buyers and sellers attend? And the answer for TIFF, oh, timing of release. We talked about that already. Okay, well, we'll get back to that. Okay. The final, final reason um, one might come to a film festival is in place of a traditional theatrical release. And I have to say that this is happening more and more these days as it's getting more difficult, as the environment's getting more difficult to find sp specifically theatrical distribution for um, many of the films that are being made. And there's a whole school of thought now about if you don't have an obvious film that the big distributors are going to start fighting over to put it into theatrical release, whether you're better off trying to use the festival as of, in lieu of a theatrical release in order to create value that you're going to then put it immediately into ancillary release. So there's been a number of opportunities like this that have been taking place at some of the smaller American film festivals like South by Southwest where a, a film um, actually premieres at the film festival and then goes into ancillary release in video and on demand and all this other stuff immediately following and that becomes their theatrical release. Now what's interesting is that um, in many cases, smaller regional festivals, when you get out of the big festivals like TIFF, will actually pay film rental. So you actually could have a source of income, not to mention the possibility that they might fly you or part of your cast or whatever to you know, wherever that film festival is, and it's an opportunity for you to do press where it's not on your dime, but it's on their dime. So in essence, you could put together a film festival strategy that's, that takes the place of the entire theatrical release and then create value. And this clearly is something that only works for smaller budget movies because you're probably not going to be able to recoup millions and millions of dollars this way. But the other time that this sometimes happens is in the case of films that are uh, pejoratively known as failed theatricals, which are films that are designed to be theatrically driven but in fact are not so execution dependent. And because they might have some stars in them or something about them that makes them relevant from a commercial perspective, even though there's no distributor who's willing to put up enough money to put it out into a traditional theatrical release, again, the festival circuit could end up being the theatrical release, traveling around with the film and actually creating this kind of value that can pay off on VOD. VOD specifically, but it could be any of, any of the ancillary markets. Okay, so um, let's just talk a minute about um, the advantages specifically of the Toronto, Inter Toronto Film Festival. Um, buyers and sellers do attend, even though the market is unofficial. You've heard that enough times today already. It is the largest gathering of North American press of any film festival. If the Toronto people are not willing to tout it themselves, I'll say it out loud. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, between American and Canadian press, I don't think there's any other North American festival that draws the number of press that the Toronto Film Festival does. Um, the studios use it essentially as a junket. Um, they know that there's so many uh, press that are going to be here that it's their opportunity to get a lot of press done in a very short period of time. You know, movie stars um, have very crowded schedules and just trying to get them to do press for a movie is not as uh, easy as it may sound. So that if you can get their attention for just a short period of time and get as much press knocked out as you possibly can, that's a huge deal. The fact that 
all of this press is already in Toronto and they don't have to pay to fly them into a traditional junket means that it's actually a very efficient way of getting an enormous amount of press for a movie in a very short period of time. Um, enthusiastic audiences. Toronto is known for having audiences that unlike any other film festival, you can show some obscure subtitled movie on a Sunday morning at nine o'clock and somehow there's a crowd there. Um, and, and it works well when you're trying to convince buyers, obviously, to have interest in your movie, to have a lot of really good buzz on the streets. If they see a film with that enthusiastic audience, it can make the difference between um, deciding that they're interested in the movie or not. I once made a joke that um, was actually not, not so much of a joke as it what was a reality that unfortunately is not quite as funny now for reasons that will become obvious. Where uh, And it was actually quoted in Variety, which made me um, unpopular for five minutes. Um, but, it, but it was that I, I said you had to discount the reaction to the film in Toronto by the same percentage as the currency. Um, now, of course, it doesn't quite work anymore because, um, as we know, uh, we're trading one-to-one -one these days. Um, it's, it, the, the festival's really well organized and really easy to navigate. I have to say that, that I could not say that about a whole lot of other film festivals. Even some of the most world-renowned film festivals are much more difficult to navigate than this place is. And as I said earlier, I think it's gotten even better as a result of this new downtown location. Um, okay, so now let's start with each of these potential agendas. The selling your film is the one that seems to be of the most interest to all of you. Um, you need press attention and buzz to do that. Again, it's all about audiences and press. So how do we do that? First of all, these are the, the things that I would say are the essentials. We, you know, you've talked a lot during the course of the day today about other things that you can be doing to get attention. But for one thing, I would have some kind of a poster available to be hang, hung up in the sales office, um, you know, if you're clever and ambitious enough, there are ways in which you could barter with local um, store owners in the neighborhood to have them put it up in their window or something like that. You're just trying to create an impression of the film being everywhere. And, you know, what you have to think through if you're going to create a poster for your film is that your target audience, when you're at a festival like this and you're trying to sell it to a buyer, is the buyers. It's not the audience at large. So what you have to do is think in terms of what would be the way in which a distributor would look at this and go, oh, that looks commercial. Oh, that looks like it might have a life to it. Oh, I can see the hook in that film. So you have to try to get your arms around what it is that you're going to be trying to sell about this particular movie. They don't have to be full one sheet size, by the way, you know, which is the standard size that you see in movie theaters. In fact, if you make smaller posters, you'll find that they're more usable because you'll, you'll find more places that people will allow you to put them. Um, the website up and running, it's really critical that you have a destination to send people to for more information. So um, you know, one of the things that I think, if I had any advice at all about the, um, the website, it would be that, that given that we're in an age of social media, that the more dynamic you make the website, the better. And what I mean by that is that I think that the days of a static website for a film are over. Every, it's not special anymore to just say, I have a website for my movie. It just, everybody's got a website for their movie. What you want is something that's, that has, is a destination where people are gonna come back. And that's the way you build a following for the movie over time. So that yes, you want the press kit there, you want the cast and crew there, you want the backstory of the film somehow there. If you have a trailer, you're gonna want it there. But I would highly recommend thinking about going to a blog format with it so that you can continually add more stuff to it. And I realize it's a little bit too late for those of you who are, have films that are already premiering here, but one of the pieces of advice that I give to filmmakers is that you should start this when you're starting production. That, that you know, having blog items continually appearing all through production with stills and with footage and with all kinds of stuff is a way of creating advance interest that's going to end up translating into hopefully a bit of following. And when we talk a little bit about, more about social media, um, I have to say that, that it is a selling point to a distributor to be able to say to them, 
I've got this many followers on Twitter, I've got this many followers on Facebook. Um, it's meaningful. And if you can start building that up early in the process, that's, that's great. But the website is ultimately the destination. That's where you're sending people for really in-depth information or collecting the information. Um, I'd, I'd love to spend more time on this, on the social media aspect in the website. Um, it's, it's something that uh, I, I do seminars about all the time. And you know, part of what I believe in is making all this stuff work together. And part of it is about automating it. Because I know that a lot of you, particularly filmmakers who really want to just get on and make their next movie, a lot of times their eyes start rolling when you start talking about this stuff because it's like they can't figure out how you can find the time of day to be doing all of this and also thinking about all the other stuff that you want to be doing. Um, you know, you're not necessarily, you, you didn't sign up necessarily to be full-time marketers, um, but it is part of the job. But one of the things is that there are all these incredible tools that are available now to automate an enormous number of these things. So that just as an example, we were talking a little bit earlier about um, Twitter versus Facebook. And uh, I have to say that I, I'm a complete believer that I believe that Twitter is a much more powerful tool than Facebook. But on the other hand, all I did, all, the, people think that I'm face, on Facebook all the time, and I'm never on Facebook. And I just linked my Twitter account to Facebook to the point where every time I tweet, it becomes my status on Facebook. And I get a lot of response on Facebook who think that I'm there, but I'm not. I mean, I rarely ever go to Facebook. So these are things that, that as you learn the tools a little bit, or if you can't, um, if, you, uh, if you find it beyond your ability, both in terms of thinking this way or having the time available to do it, then find yourself a 12-year-old. Um, it's, you know, uh, as, I think there, was a, there was a line in one, some Groucho Marx movie, uh, some Marx Brothers movie, where um, uh, I think it's, you know, Chico comes in and says, uh, you know, this is so simple, a 12-year-old child could, uh, could do it. And Groucho goes, run out and get me a 12-year-old child. But anyway, yeah. So, um, okay, and then postcards. Postcards are great, but don't make big postcards because it defeats the purpose of them. You want them to be pocket-sized. Because the whole point, and, and I'm going to say this about anything that you decide you want to give away, try to make it small and pocketable. Even if you're going to carry screeners around of your movie, Forget the clamshell thing. I would say make it so that people can slip it in their pocket because otherwise they're going to leave it someplace and it's not going to do you any good. I mean, we'll get to screeners in a few minutes, but the, but the point is that you know, what you want is a postcard that has the same art on it, theoretically, that um, the poster has, but on the other side, you want all your screening times. You want to make it as, as easy as possible for people to be able to um, find the screenings of your movie. And to go one step further from something that came up in one of the earlier sessions, if you're in a shorts program, I would highly recommend that not only do you discuss how you're going to market together with your other shorts companions that are in the same program, but I would think about creating one postcard for the entire shorts program. Because you're all showing at the same time, but I think it's much more compelling to be able to hand somebody something for the whole shorts program, share the cost, everybody's promoting everybody else's film, you're increasing dramatically the number of people who are gonna become aware of what you're doing as a result of that. And maybe you can even put the contact information for everybody who, uh, every one of the shorts that's in the program on the postcard so that it, it does the trick for everyone. I was also, it's sort of related to that, but I was also gonna recommend for the shorts filmmakers that you might want to start a Facebook group for your shorts program so that all of you are actually promoting the same shorts program at the same time. And it actually creates more contributors of content to that group so that it makes it more dynamic and makes it much more, more interesting for people who might want to try to follow it. You can just end the group at the end of the film festival, but the point is during the film festival, it's an opportunity to promote that whole package and you've got a bunch of people now that are helping you out that wouldn't have been helping you before. Um, okay. Get your pitch down. You've been hearing this all day. Um, you know, I'll add my own two cents here, but um, you know, Charlotte hit the nail on the head in the other room. It's about the concept, not the story. Um, if I were pitching that that film that she was talking about in there where, you know, it's some African thing, whatever. 
I mean, I, I, I would start out by saying, you know, let's assume for the moment that somebody, you know, actually says to me, you know, so what's your film about? You know, and I'm, my answer is, well, on the surface, it wouldn't seem so commercial, but, <laughs> and, and by acknowledging the fact that you're aware of the, of the market, then immediately they're gonna tune in a little bit more because they wanna hear what the but is. And the but should be something compelling that it gives you that, that, that something to talk about that's gonna get people interested in the film. And you have to try to divorce yourself from your own movie long enough to see it as an outsider, to be able to say, if I were a viewer and I was looking at all of the films that are available in this film festival, what would get me interested in seeing this particular movie? And if you can answer that question in a really concise way, then you're probably three quarters of the way there in terms of having your pitch down. Um, I, I've always felt like as a film marketer that the one thing that made me good at it was the fact that I am my own consumer. I mean, I would just be curious, a show of hands, how many people in here actually regularly go to a movie theater to see movies? Okay, well that's a pretty good proportion, although this is a self-selecting group. Um, but, but I would say that, that you know, I'm, it's frightening how many times I actually do sit with filmmakers who don't raise their hands. And I always feel like, you know, how would anybody feel um, entitled to a theatrical audience if they're not their own consumer? And so just think about what it's like to get you out of your chair and into a movie theater, and that'll put you into the right head to be able to answer that question about what makes your particular film commercial. And by the way, if, you're, if you can't answer that question, that's not a badge of shame or anything. It just means that maybe you should be thinking a little bit more out of the box and not about traditional theatrical release for your film. Because uh, one of the things that I want to keep touching on in this talk is about being realistic about your expectations. Um, now, I put up backstory there. Um, I do think that having a good backstory is one of the hooks that could help to get people interested in a particular movie. But as has been pointed out, it's not enough of a backstory to just be the poor independent filmmaker who just scraped together enough money to make the movie. We're all in that boat together. So you got to think of something that's much more interesting than that. And again, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to step out of your own, you know, your own filmmaking thing and think about it from a consumer's point of view. Is there really an interesting story here that would make me interested in seeing the movie? Beasts of the Southern Wild, you know, one of the things that got people interested in that movie was the idea that it was created by a collective where they, you know, there was nobody in it that anybody had ever heard of, but it was a, a theater group that had honed the material and in some ways a little bit Mike Lee-ish in that they were, you know, they were actually rehearsing a non-script until it became a script and then, you know, kept working on it in that way and that it was a group of people who had gotten to know each other by working on a short together. I mean, there's an interesting story there. Is that like a major hook? But it was just enough to get people to say, sounds interesting, I'd be, I, you know, like, let's check it out. And then, of course, they see the movie, they get blown away by it, and that's, that's you know, that's how history is made. Um, danger of overhype. Don't use, when you're talking about your movie, don't use words like it's gonna be a smash hit, it's gonna be, you know, whatever. Um, I think that's one of the worst things that can happen to you is to be the most anticipated film without distribution in a film festival, because those are the kinds of movies people end up hating. Um, and not because the movie's bad, but because expectations are important. Um, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's a point that is so fundamental to what we do as movie marketers, which is that you wanna set up the right set of expectations that the film delivers on. So if you promise something that's way up here, and then it turns out that the film's only here, then you, what you have is disappointment. You don't wanna set up a film for disappointment. You wanna talk about it in a way that highlights what's good about it and why people might wanna see it, but without crossing the line into, into hyping it. Um, know your market. Who are the right buyers? Don't waste your time trying to track down people who would not be the right people to do it. Read the trades so you get an idea of who those people are. Um, you know, certainly with the major studios these days, it's really obvious what kinds of films they're interested in doing, um, and not a single person in this room made one of them. 
Um, but uh, when you get to the next layer down of the, the, you know, the sort of mini majors or larger independents or whatever, a lot of them, even though they're chasing things that they think are gonna be commercial, if you really study what they do, you'll find out that there are patterns there in terms of weak spots that they have where they go, this is the kind of movie that we understand because we've done other movies like this. And so you have a better chance of getting that distributor to, um, to actually pay attention to you. So one of the things that you want to do is think of comparables, realistic comparables that you can point to and say, my movie market-wise, not the plot, not the you know, genre, those are too obvious and too general, but rather we want to think about from a commercial perspective, what are the movies that are kind of the same size as this, that kind of are geared to the same audience. And then when you look at who distributed those movies, um, hopefully they were successful enough that they'll want to try another hand at it. Um, obviously, if the movies you discover all tanked, then I'll go back to plan B, which is that you know the odds are you're going to have trouble finding a distributor that's going to be interested in it. Um, you really have to ask that, answer that question, is it theatrical? If you're moviegoers and you see what's out there, and you, know, you should be getting a sense of what people are interested in putting into theaters these days, and also if you're one of those really frequent moviegoers that goes to see everything that comes out, you know the ones that you went to where there was nobody else in the audience, and those are the ones that you should be ingesting is like, well, in the current theatrical marketplace, this is gonna to be tough. Not necessarily impossible, but difficult. Um, now this is something that some people might disagree with, but I believe in trying to have your first press and industry screening be after your first public screening. To folks in the back are going, eek. Um, but I, I just, you know, like I, I feel like particularly for a film that has nothing going for it commercially up front, that the public can help to drive some buzz that would help you to get more people to come to your press and industry screening. So that it's, it's a kind of a reverse form of momentum that hopefully will then create the momentum for your ongoing screenings. That's just a personal preference of mine. Um, and this is kind of interesting if you can get the opportunity to do this. And I don't know how much of it the TIFF folks are doing these days. This has worked really well for me at Sundance, I have to tell you. But um, volunteering to have a screening for the, before the festival starts for people who are going to be volunteering at the festival um, because they talk up movies constantly when they're dealing with folks that are coming into town. And, um, and it's just a way of getting some early buzz on, on the film. Be realistic. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Let, we can talk a little bit about the current appetite. Um, you know, the theatrical market has generally been shrinking, but this has been true, by the way, since the 40s. So it's not a recent development. The number of admissions in North America keeps going down. The only reason why we keep hearing about box office records is because the price of admission keeps going up. And there's a kind of false indicator of that right now because um, 3D has been pressing the, the ticket prices up. Um, so... In, and, and by the way, that's all 3D is, in case you were wondering, is an excuse to raise the admission price. Um, so, okay. So, um, theatrical is riskier than ever because, you know, the studios have trained audiences to think that the way that they find out about their movies is about the, the multi-million dollar campaigns that they have going on, which it's very, very hard to compete with if you don't have that kind of a budget available to you. The One of the... More recent developments is that the DVD numbers are collapsing. Um, we used to be able to say, well, you know, you could afford to lose money in the theatrical marketplace, but the DVD market will make up for it because you create a profile that then gets, um, you know, gets paid off um, when the film comes out on DVD. But DVD numbers are way down. People are, are much more interested these days in the subscription services like Netflix or in VOD where they're paying for things a la carte. Um, it's much more of, let's call it a rental market than it is um, a buying market, which was true for a long time on DVD. So what that means is that it's much, much harder to make the case that a theatrical release is somehow going to pay off down the road. So distributors are essentially more conservative than they've ever been about what they're willing to take on theatrically. 
Now, that having said all that, it's going to make it sound like I'm being a real bummer. But um, in, in reality, I'm very optimistic about what thing, where things are going. But I think we're just in an in-between period right now where what's going to be taking the place of the DVD market, which is all of these online venues that are happening, um, is, has yet to mature into enough of a market to take the place of the missing DVD numbers that have disappeared. Uh, the, the one really positive thing in the marketplace right now, and I think that many of you will end up getting a chance to take advantage of this, is that as the big corporations start to try to figure out this online market, there's a little bit of a war going on for exclusive content to differentiate their services from everybody else's. And so I've witnessed this a number of times in my career, like when the home video market first started or when the cable market first started. Well, in this case, what's happening is that a lot of them are overpaying for rights to movies just for the sake of being able to say that they've got exclusive content that their competitors don't. So is we're not talking big money because they don't know what this market is yet, but at least it means that you're in demand. The minute you own content, you are in demand. Um, TV outlets have very specific needs. Um, all the cable outlets in the United States, which is one of the, the best sources of, of revenue, um, they're so specific as to almost being a joke in terms of the, you know, lifetime network saying you know, that they're, they're, what all they're interested in is women in jeopardy. So if you have a movie about women in jeopardy, you've potentially got a sale. Uh, whereas Oxygen is, you know, empowering women, you know, that's much more positive, I guess. Um, you, know, the, uh, you know, you've got ESPN um, actually buying sports-oriented movies, but they've always got to be somewhat inspirational. Um, you know, HBO buys a lot of documentaries, but they have, a very, they have very specific needs in terms of they hate voiceover, just for those of you who were thinking HBO, they, they, they usually won't buy anything with voiceover in it. Um, no talking heads, you know, it's gotta be somewhat verite. And, um, and Sheila Nevins, who's their, their key buyer, um, you know, in her office has uh, a poster from Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Cir Circus on her wall and is fond of pointing to it and talking about how what she's interested in is inspired by that because what HBO is all about is water cooler talk. They want people talking about their work, so they love controversy, they love, so, so you know, you, I can go on all day, but the point is that the TV folks have very specific needs, and if you don't fit into what their narrow needs are, then chances are there's no television market these days, with the potential exception of tiny little networks um, that, are, that are not gonna pay very much. Um, and online distribution, as we've just been talking about, is in its infancy. Um, you know, this is, this is sort of interesting, which is that have some expert advice about the likely buyers for your film. I was telling you to try to do your own research in terms of reading the trades, but the reality is if you've got friends who are in the business who you can screen the movie for and really have an honest talk, encourage them not to, um, I, I have to remember that this is being, filmed, um, but, but have a, a truly honest talk about the prospects in the marketplace so that they're not just chatting you up um, or flattering you, then it, it, it'll help because if you walk into a film festival with realistic expectations about what the market might be, you won't waste time on people who would not be interested in your project, trying to chase them down or getting them interested or whatever which by the way does, does two things that are negative for you. One is it wastes your time, but the other one is it wastes their time, and the reality is you don't get a second shot at people if they think you've wasted their time. So do your homework about who the potential buyers are and don't waste your time knocking on the wrong doors. Um, and be prepared for plan B. It's sort of what I've been leading up to, which is that um, a lot of independent filmmakers these days, if they've reached the conclusion that, they, that the odds of them getting a traditional theatrical deal are small, they start thinking about what would be the other ways in which I can get this film out there and perhaps use the festival as a launching pad as opposed to trying to get distribution. I've worked on some films that have, that have tried to have it both ways where 
you know, essentially what they did was walking into the film festival, they said to themselves, you know what, let's assume we're not going to get a theatrical deal. Let's do everything as if we're going to get this film out into the marketplace. But then if it turns out that out of left field, some distributor walks up and makes the right deal, you could always still make that deal. So it's about um, the potential of using the festival circuit, as I was pointing out earlier, in lieu of a traditional theatrical release. So you might think about everything from the self-publishing of a DVD or thinking in terms of talking to um, the aggregators who actually are really good at getting the film into all of the online, um, all of the on online outlets, but building to that through the use of the festival. I'm going to try to speed through a lot of this because I really do want to leave time for your questions. Um, how to get press attention. You've already heard a lot about this um, uh, today, but having a publicist or working closely with the festival publicists is really important. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy to get the access to all those journalists without having some sort of help. And what your publicist will theoretically, or the publicist here at the festival will theoretically help you do, is be a sounding board to find the way of talking about your movie that would be really helpful to get people interested in it. Um, work on a proper press kit. Uh, this is something that is, you know, again, you may need some guidance to do this, but you should be gathering information about, you know, your, the bios of the key people involved, trying to, to lay out what that backstory is that you want to really talk about, having a good synopsis, which, um, you know, one of, the, one of the interesting things is that we use the word synopsis, but in reality, for many of the films that are not purely plot-driven, meaning that they're either about character or they're about atmosphere more than they are about plot, which is true of a lot of film festival movies, the synopsis could literally be pointing people in that direction. What is it that you want them to be focusing on? Um, clearly, this is a topic that requires more than a couple of seconds, but it's something that you should just be prepared. You know, these days, a lot of it is delivered electronically, so you're talking about just a PDF. Um, I agree with um, the gentleman from The Star earlier who said, don't spend money on a fancy press kit. It's a complete waste of money. Um, if it's just stapled pages together, all they need is the information. It's not about the paper it's on or the folder it's in or anything else. Um, rehearse your pitch. We already talked about this. Um, I would say, if possible, avoid the first weekend of the festival for a lot of your activity because, I mean, maybe you can lead into the rest of the festival, but the first weekend of the festival is really about the, the studio junkets for the most part. Certainly for the press it is. It may not be for the public, but certainly for the press, they're all focused on the studio movies for the first weekend. Um, having an early screening for local press, this came up also in one of the earlier sessions. Um, I would say, I would go even a, f a little bit further because clearly the festival can't screen everything early. Um, but I would say, again, you've heard this, be, don't be precious with screeners. The, if the local press watches, local Toronto press watches your film early, there's a much, much better chance that you'll be included in whatever um, what we call curtain openers happen, which is like the, 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 um, the article that they write opening the festival, sort of encapsulating what it is. Even if you get a sentence in one of those publications, that's really good. And I would also think about, for those of you who are not from Toronto, um, thinking in terms of your local press, wherever you're from, is getting a screener to them before the festival, because that could help actually help to create some local momentum about your movie. Um, and it's even if you have something that's online about it that you can send as a link to somebody else, that your your local press are the ones who are most likely to be wanting to focus on your film as being the center of attention at the film festival. Um, and have screeners available in advance. I was just talking about these curtain raiser articles are really important. I mean, I've done this even with publications like the New York Times, which would seem impenetrable, but the New York Times writes an article every year that's uh, like the curtain opener for the Toronto Film Festival. They write one for Sundance. They write one for the New York Film Festival. If you can manage to get them to see your movie early, there's a much better chance that you'll end up as part of whatever articles they're going to end up write, writing. Talent availability. Um, this brings up a couple of different points. Clearly, um, on the one hand, having talent available means that you have that many more potential press hits that could come out of it. 
But if your talent is not well known, then in reality, what you've got is more baggage than anything else. Um, one trap that a lot of um, independent producers fall into when they go to a major film festival like this is that of course everybody associated with the film wants to be there to celebrate with you, to be with you, to experience the first screening, et cetera, et cetera. And it could be a real drain, not just in terms of trying to get them all tickets for the, the actual screening that they want to go to, but also things like going out to dinner at the end of every evening and, and somehow when the check comes, everybody looks at the producer as if, you, as if you're like the money person and you know, you've got to set the tone early by making no promises and in fact maybe even going the other way and, say, and warning them in advance, look, I can't babysit you all day long. You know, hopefully you can you know, go to see other movies, do whatever. If we need you, we'll call upon you. But, it's, you, know, but you, you have to kind of set the tone so that they're not expecting that you're gonna be like shoving them all day long in front of journalists because that's frankly unrealistic if they're not a big movie star. Um, okay, your team. The publicist we've talked about a lot. Personally, I think it's, whether it's the publicist here at the festival or somebody you hire separately, I really do think that they're perhaps the most important person on your team. Um, a lawyer, somebody who knows how to negotiate, um, it needs to be an entertainment lawyer. It can't be somebody who does real estate for a living um, because the quirks of the way movie deals are made, um, you'll end up on an hourly basis, if you're paying by the hour, which most lawyers are, you'll end up paying for hours upon hours to educate the lawyer about the way that film deals are done. So don't, just because you have a friend of the family who's quote unquote a lawyer, that doesn't mean that's the person you want representing you. You need somebody who has some experience making movie deals. Um, producers rep, there's many different kinds of producers reps, and this should say really producers rep, sales agent, um, but the ones that I always feel are the ones that really are worth having are the marketing folks. Um, having, you know, the, you want somebody who does have a Rolodex who knows the buyers, basically. Anybody know what a Rolodex is? No, just. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, you're talking about helping, them helping you to formulate your general strategy. And, uh, and then, of course, there's the deal-making part of it. But the interesting thing is that you can come up with any combination of these people that actually works for you, depending on what their strengths and weaknesses are. And you, you know, I'm speaking to the producers in the room, you know the things that you feel capable of doing and the things that you feel not capable of doing. And so you try to bolster your team with the people who actually can, can take care of your own perceived inadequacies. So if you feel like you're a really good marketer and you know how to get out there and give away stuff and hand out things and do whatever, then maybe you only need the publicist and the lawyer and you don't need the rep. So you know, it's like you have to just come up with your own personal idea of what the, what that combina the right combination is for you. Um, festival etiquette, I'll just be real quick about this, but be persistent but not pushy, respect how busy people are be open to screeners. People are so busy that trying to get them to your screening may not be possible. So, you know, as, as unfortunate as it may be that most of these buyers watch most of their movies on screeners these days, it does mean that they're used to evaluating things that way. And, you know, even if the early scouts for the distributors end up coming to your screening and they see how well the audience responds to it or whatever, the next layer of management that's gonna have to see the film before they make a decision about whether to acquire it, acquire it or not, they're still gonna end up asking for screeners. So again, you've heard this before, don't be precious about it. Um, don't launch into a pitch to anybody without first sort of asking for permission. The way these things happen at parties or whatever is you're, you, you introduce yourself to somebody at the bar or whatever, you know, hopefully the conversation comes around to, well, what do you do? Well, I'm a filmmaker, I have a film here. Oh, really, that's interesting, what's it about? That is the question you're waiting for. But if they turn their back on you and, it's, and it turns out that they're interested in something else or that they're just not on, you know, right that, at that moment on, in quotes, then, or on duty, I guess is the way to put it, then that's that. But hopefully you end up, at the very least, handing them one of those postcards that we talked about. 
Um, don't attend the press and industry screenings, please. Um, you're gonna drive yourself crazy because the press and industry screenings, um, you know, the buyers at least, in many cases, will walk in and out. It's gonna, it's gonna make you just nuts watching this. You're gonna be more worried than you have to be. And hovering is a bad idea because it makes them nervous. So, you know, what I would say is avoid it. If you have to be there because you don't have a rep or a publicist who's willing to do the, the dirty work for you, then what I would say is only be there at the beginning and then disappear. Somebody in here may disagree with that, but that's been my experience. Um, and this is all pretty obvious. Have realistic expectations. There's many events competing for attention. Things rarely happen immediately. It's the beginning of a process. And in many cases, it'll be months before what happens at the festival is actually gonna pay off for you. Um, and job number one is networking. Make friends. The, and and it, even if it means other filmmakers make friends because you never know what one relationship is gonna lead to after another. All the other filmmakers are in many ways in the same boat as you are. And so therefore, they wanna make friends as much as you do. To the extent that you actually do that, it's, it's something that's gonna pay off for you down the road. Go to the industry parties that you can get into. The crazy Hollywood ones with the big stars, not worth it. I, I, I have a rule, which is that if you have to fight to get in, it's not worth it. Um, it's, it's the ones that are a little bit quieter, a little bit more staid, where you're gonna meet people who actually can lead you to something. Um, hang out in the filmmaker lounge and the other hospitality areas because that's another place where you can network successfully. See films, it gives you something to talk about. The, what, the great thing at film festivals is that people, the first thing they're gonna say is have you seen anything good? And if you've actually seen some movies, it gives you an entree to begin having a conversation with them that could then lead you to them asking you to actually pitch your film to them. Um, carry the postcards with you and carry the screeners with you um, so that you have them available at any given moment. And this is one we're gonna skip um, because otherwise we would not have enough time. So um, anyway, so that's, that's the, the general pitch for me. Um, mm -hmm. Glad to take any questions on this subject or any other. Anybody? Can't see you, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, shorts, uh, as, as has been pointed out, are more resume pieces most of the time than they are um, a, an actual uh, living, let's put it that way. Um, trying to monetize a short is difficult, but there are aggregators who pull shorts together into programs, both online and on DVD and uh, some television networks around the world that do take shorts. Um, I would certainly, if I were you, if I were looking for a distributor or a sales agent, make sure that you're looking up the ones that actually do handle shorts, and there are some that do. Um, and you know, I, I would say that uh, you know, the, the one area of growth in the US at least for shorts at the moment has to do with the fact that there's a lot of, of online outlets that are um, monetizing them through surrounding them with advertising. And that while it's not a huge amount of money, there's actually money to be made. And that actually works for you in two ways. One is that you do have some money coming in theoretically, but the other one is that it actually gets your film out there and hopefully leads to your ability to make your next film. Um, I wish the prognosis were a little bit better than that, but um, certainly in theaters, um, I can speak mostly for the U.S. market, but there's no way of monetizing shorts in theaters. If you're lucky, you can get somebody to show it just for the hell of it. But most of the theater owners are way too busy to start screening shorts and worrying about it, so they just don't. They'd much rather use that real estate for advertising. Um, and then, uh, you know, on DVD, the only real market for shorts is when they're ganged together into a thematic group or whatever. Um, there's a company in the U.S. called Strand Releasing that um, at least once a year puts out a group of gay shorts that you know, has been a very big seller for them. Um, and there are other sorts of things like that that go on. Um, and then, of course, there's the Oscar shorts, but uh, that's, you know, dreaming. Um, uh, I really liked your, um, the list of TIFF advantages, and I just also wonder in... Um, in the group of A-list festivals, 
the fact that we don't have a competition, that there's not a competition uh, program, do you think that's another um, advantage that we have as TIFF, or what are your feelings about it not being competitive? Well, I mean, what you don't have is a jury competition. You, there is a most popular film award, which has existed since the earliest days of this festival, and I always think that audience awards are actually a better um, sign to distributors that a film is commercial. Uh, you know, people always point to Sex, Lies, and Videotape and its emergence out of Sundance, um, and the fact is that people forget that it won the, the audience award, that the grand prize that year went to a different film. So um, I, I do think the audience award that's given here is meaningful and over the years has gone to films that, that actually have had a commercial life. So I think it's very meaningful to a distributor. I think, you know, not having a jury award, um, you know, is, is there an opportunity there that might have existed that is left on the table, perhaps? But on the other hand, I think it tends to make the festival feel perhaps a little bit more democratic. Thanks. I thought that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. I've been doing this for years, and I learned so much from you just now. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you, it's a little thing that sort of uh, went by quickly when you were speaking about the avenues, about how to sell a film in places where a film can be sold. And you did mention this word, aggregators. And I wondered if you could talk a bit more about that and what that is and who is that. And It's a, re it's a really good question. It's a, new, it's a new concept that's emerged as a result of the online marketplace. Although, in a certain kind of way, the concept always existed, it was just called something else. Um, basically, the large online outlets are not interested in doing business with you directly for one-off films. Why would that be? And I'm talking about people like Netflix, iTunes, um, those are two really good examples. Why is it that Netflix and iTunes don't want to do business with you directly? Well, the answer is that they would have to have a team of acquisitions executives in the thousands to be able to do one-off deals individually with filmmakers. So instead, they depend on this, these people who call themselves aggregators that essentially act as a middleman, middle person, between them and the filmmakers so that all independent films, if they're going to be bought by iTunes or by Netflix, have to go through one of their approved av aggregators. So in effect, they're, what they're doing is they're saying that these are the people who are gonna actually decide which films are worthwhile and which ones are not. Um, now, the reason why the concept has always existed is that, that or, um, companies like Walmart or Best Buy have always had the same policy. You can't do business with Walmart or Best Buy directly. There were always middle persons that were making the deals that they depended on to narrow down all of the product that's available in the world to the ones that might be of interest to them, and they learn to trust those people. So um, in, in the US, there's like five companies that are designated as um, the aggregators who most of these companies will do business with. Um, you know, Synetic is an aggregator, New Video is an aggregator, um, and there's a few others. So, you know, that, that's what an aggregator is. They take a small percentage of, of every sale that they make. Um, and, uh, and they do, frankly, not all that much in return other than giving you access to the deals that they have in place. Hey, um, so uh, well, I'm here with a short, and I'll be you know, sort of promoting the short, but I'd say I'm more interested in, in kind of moving towards a, a first feature. What do you say is the best advice you can give for somebody who is trying to get an initial first feature off the ground as far as who you pitch to or, or I don't know, what, what's, what's the biggest piece of advice you give for that? Well, I mean, first of all, that's the right way of thinking because your short, in theory, is what makes you valuable and then enables you to, to have access to people to pitch your feature to. But hopefully you have the combination in place, which is not only is that you have a finished film that's now being shown in one of the best film festivals in the world, but theoretically you should have the screenplay for your next movie ready to go. If you don't, you're not going to be taking advantage of quite as much momentum as you might have been otherwise. It doesn't mean you can't re recreate it later, but it's probably premature for you to start pitching people on your next feature until you've developed it enough because the, the, your goal, when you're pitching people for a project that's not made yet, your goal is to get them to say, that sounds really good, let me read it. And if the let me read it 
takes six months before they get it into their hands. It's as if that conversation never really happened. So what you're going to want to do is at the moment when you have something that is really um, that, that's ready for the marketplace, that short it's not going to cease to exist. But hopefully you'll have it with the little laurel leaves on it that it was in the Toronto Film Festival and maybe other film festivals by then. And that'll hopefully be your entree. What you might be able to do in terms of the actual festival, if, you're, if your next project is not ready yet, um, is just get people who might be able to be helpful to you at that next step to come and see it. I mean, if you talk about it in those terms, if you say, you know, that I, uh, I don't quite have my next feature ready, but I know it's going to be this genre, but I could really use help, you might be able to use the screening to find yourself a producer to hook up with if you're the director or the screenwriter or whatever. Um, what you're going to try to do is network yourself into a team of people who are rooting for you as a filmmaker and who you can go back to at the point at which you're, you're ready to roll, as it were. I guess, you know, it's about three weeks or so to the festival, or four weeks, anyways. Oh, plenty um, of writing time. Well, <laughs> what do you do between midnight and 6 a.m.? Yeah. Well, what I'm wondering is, in, in these next few weeks, is, you know, where, for a short, is my time best spent? Should I spend the majority of my time figuring out how to promote my short, or should I spend more time really uh, honing certain ideas that I have now so that they could be to a point that they'd be ready to pitch and promote? So it's kind of a balancing act, I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, what I've heard, I didn't know this, but what I've heard is that the shorts tend to sell out anyway, so it's not like you're going to be trying to spend all your time trying to fill the place up, so if that's the case, you're going to have your audience, so now I would say that I would put my efforts toward some specific individuals who you think would be worthwhile to be there, because you're not, you know, like you don't have to go nuts just trying to make sure that there's an audience there. So I think I would put some, some time into getting your next project ready. 